I, I just wanted to ask you about the Houthis and uh, given your expertise in Yemen, their blockade of ships and how there has been an uh, insistence from the administration that their attacks on commercial shipping vessels is sufficient for the United States to respond with bombing. Um, meaning a, an action also that d they don't necessarily need to go to Congress for as well because it's a response to an attack. That is clearly, in my view, a distortion of uh, wartime law and, uh, and, and rules of engagement in that way. But also what frustrates me is this, this lack of uh, taking the Houthis' claims about why, they're, why they have been attacking these ships um, on their face. They're saying this is in order to put pressure on the United States to stop supporting Israel. But then we're hearing, oh, they're just terrorists. Um, can you speak a little bit about their incentives and how that not that, and if that the the administration in the United States is um, perception or, or public uh, posture on this is different from the the reality? I mean, the this has been great PR for the Houthis, um, you know, kind of coming out as one of the only Arab governments actually trying to do something for the people of Palestine. Um, I, and I do take seriously their assertion that, you know, if the blockade of Gaza were lifted and, you know, if there were a ceasefire that they would stop attacking ships. Um, I, I, I believe them on that um, because they are interested in, in establishing themselves as, you know, the internationally recognized government of Yemen, although at this point, even though they do control the, you know, the territory where the majority of Yemenis live, um, they remain sort of the, the unrecognized de facto power. Um, the U.S. government is not interested in bolstering their legitimacy. I do think that the Saudis are enjoying, you know, kind of experiencing schadenfreude in that they wanted more support from the U.S. against the Houthis, and the U.S. was really pushing the Saudis, which is great, um, you know, to, to, to accept the ceasefire that went into place in 2022, that sort of had remained in place even though it officially expired that in October of 2022. Um, and, and I do give the Biden administration credit for their efforts. Um, I mean, including Tim Lenderking, who's been trying to reach some kind of a political solution there. Um, and, and now, you know, the U.S. bombing Houthi positions. It is, I think the Saudis just kind of find it amusing because you know, just like the Saudis struggled to, um, you know, take out this sort of rag, you know, what was once a ragtag group of rebels and is now a much more powerful military force. You know, the U.S. is similarly experiencing those difficulties. Um, I do think it's interesting. We've seen kind of less attention on that lately. Um, I think the U.S. government just didn't want to give them more, more attention and credibility for that. Um, in general, you know, I mean, the, the Houthis are, are an armed militant group. I mean, they're, they block humanitarian aid. They've, they commit horrible violations of human rights. It's, they are, but they're also likely, you know, they're the de facto ruling authority in Yemen. Um, so at a certain point, you know, we'll just have to see when the international community either recognizes that or if the U.S. government decides that it is going to escalate there and really try and take them out, I think, which would be devastating for the civilian population in Yemen. Um, you know, people who know more about Yemen than I do would argue or have argued that just U.S. policy on Yemen has been so schizophrenic and, um, you know, it's, they're just, they're not great options at this point. Um, lastly, Anel, uh, I, I'm bringing it back to your piece in, in CNN here, uh, how you ended it. I just uh, wanted to touch on this in particular, where you wrote here, uh, I am haunted by the final social media post of Aaron Bushnell, 
a 25-year-old U.S. Air Force serviceman who self-immolated in front of the Israeli embassy on Wash in Washington on February 25th. Bradley, can we pull this up on the screen, please? Um, many of us like to ask ourselves, what would I do if I was alive during slavery? Or the Jim Crow South? Or apartheid? What would I do if my country was committing genocide? The answer is, you're doing it right now. I can no longer continue what I was doing. I hope that my resignation can contribute to the many efforts to push the administration to withdraw support for Israel's war for the sake of two million Palestinians who, whose lives are at risk and for the sake of America's moral standing in the world. And now, can you speak to why that particular post by Aaron uh, Bushnell spoke to you in such a way? Yeah, I am... I remember feeling shocked that Aaron's self-immolation was not addressed by the by the administration, by the government. I mean, it was such a, a horrifying and also just powerful action. Um, and I think many, many people read that post or you know were, became aware of that post and and questioned. I know I certainly did, and, and I've spoken with others who have as well. Um, and it's, you know, I, I think people maybe don't take seriously enough what he did, or I've heard people try and justify it or say, you know, he came from, you know, he, he had a lot of trauma or he came from this sort of, sort of isolated background. I've heard people say a lot of things instead of just just the reality of he made this choice um, to try to draw attention to what, what the U.S. government is doing. Um, and I, I just wish people took it more seriously and really thought about what they're doing, um, whether it's staying silent or I mean, it may seem silly, but even even just something like putting up a ceasefire sign in your window or in your yard, I think, you know, that helps people know that this is growing and like other people are also devastated by what's happening. And so I think for those who are feeling um, really disempowered by all this and if you just don't know what to do, I would say start there um, because I do think that these visible expressions of support, you know, on social media, in, in your window, in your yard, um, that helps other people know that, that they're feeling, you know, that you are reflecting their feelings, or maybe for someone who's not paying attention, they might then prompt them to look at like, wait, what's going on? Um, Cause I do think it's, it's, I, I want Aaron's death to have mattered. And I want my, you know, going through this, <laughs> some of what I've, I've been dealing with to, to matter. And I do think that even just little things like that are, are what's gonna make a difference here. Absolutely, and I just wanna say, you know, Anel, you have a, a young child, right? I, I, um, and re resigning from one's job when you have a young kid um, is not an easy decision. And I know that some of your colleagues were in similar circumstances, so I just wanna thank you for that and for all you're taking on individually to make this stand, um, because that's not easy. And I, 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 I'm sure you had these conversations with people at work. Thank um, you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in a in a position of of privilege. You know, being able to, to, um, you know, I didn't spend my whole career in state. I think you know, for me to transition back out of state, it's a little bit easier to imagine than for people who have spent their whole careers on the inside. Right. Um, and, you know, hopefully I'll, I'll find something, um, you know, I don't, don't expect to work for the government again. Well, um, well, that's, I mean, that's my other question is just of that, that you made that for a lot of people, I'm sorry. Okay, just really briefly here. I mean, what were were you excited to work for the government? Was this something that you had dreamed of? Was the colleagues that haven't resigned but are disgusted? I mean, they have probably worked their whole professional lives to get to this particular moment, right? 
definitely. I mean, I, you know, you know my background. I mean, Quincy is very critical of the U.S. government. And I think personally, having lived in the Middle East, I have many reasons to be critical of the U.S. government. Um, but it was, I was excited at the opportunity to get to be on the inside, to get to kind of see how things are done. I, I was especially interested in, in the work I was doing on human rights. Um, I, I think I would have been somewhat less interested in if, you know, I, it wasn't for that office. You know, I found that work to be very meaningful. Um, and I do, you know, I know some people have said that they, you know, while they, they support what I'm doing there, it's just like, wow, you know, it, it's just too bad because having someone like you on the inside could have been really helpful. Um, and so, you know, I, I do wonder about that, but, um, you know, I mean, maybe someday there'll, there'll be a coming administration where my resignation, um, wouldn't blacklist me, you know, maybe, maybe in, in the future, there might be a role for me, um, to go, to go back into policy. Well, I hope so. Uh, Bear, Bear and Man 12 says, please tell Nell that her name will go down in history as a savior of the innocent. Museums will speak of her name. So that's one of our, our IMers um, trying to just show some support and support from, from me as well. I really appreciate it, Nell. I mean, you, that's, it's amazing um, to, to, to witness your bravery here. I really appreciate your time today as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks to you and your team. Thank you.